Um, so you heard uh, earlier today about um, what GANs are and how they, um, the, some of the theoretical properties, but here I'm going to tell you about um, some practical um, properties of GANs and how they can be used um, for a particular scientific domain. But before I tell you about the machine learning, I have to, of course, first start by telling you about the science, um, which is why uh, a lot of us are here. Um, so this is a, the length scale um, ruler of everything. Um, and you can see I'm biased because it stops um, at visible length scales. Um, but if I, if I think of um, the goal of high energy physics, what we really want to do is understand the fundamental properties of the smallest distance scales in nature. Um, and for that, um, to probe very small distance scales, we need a, a very um, powerful microscope. And in fact, we'd like to build the most powerful microscope ever built to probe length scales down to 10 to the minus 20 um, meters. And you to think about how, how big that is. So you know, an atom is 10 to the minus 10, a proton is 10 to the minus 15, and we want to go even smaller than that. Um, and to probe such small length scales, we need a giant microscope. And the most powerful microscope ever built is the Large Hadron Collider. And uh, that's the top um, picture here is a, a segment of this um, 20 plus mile accelerator um, that's in Geneva, Switzerland. It collides protons at very high energy, and then they smash together, and they're observed by a very powerful um, camera, um, which one of them is, for instance, the Atlas detector, shown here in the bottom right, which is a five story um, uh, detector that's 100 meters underneath the ground and has something like 100 million readout channels. So you can think of it like a very granular, um, very fast, um, pixelated digital camera. Um, okay, so let me tell you about how we use generative models to empower um, data analysis and energy physics, in particular collider-based energy physics, like what I just mentioned. Um, so basically, um, the idea is that we want to do inference. So there's some theory of everything. Um, our current theory of everything is called the standard model. Um, but someone might posit some new theory, and we want to test it. So it works if someone posits a new theory, it has some parameters, then we take the theory and we have some simulations. And that's this black box here, which says physics simulations. Um, this uh, en encompasses an incredible amount of, of, of energy and effort um, to model um, processes that span many orders of magnitude and length scales. Um, and out of the simulator comes something that looks like real data that we might collect in the detector. And then we have some pattern recognition that we run on those synthetic data and compare those to uh, pattern recognition output that are run on real data. So we have um, the LHC, which takes input from nature and produces um, real data, which is then compared to the synthetic data. And we do this comparison to do inference on um, whatever theory we started with. So basically, the generative models connect our theory with the data. Um, and I'll just very briefly mention that pattern recognition is, is of course, a place where we do a lot of machine learning. Um, but today, I'm only going to talk about um, the physics simulators. So GANs are a really powerful um, generative model that I think you heard about earlier today. And I'm going to tell you, um, I'm going to focus on one, but I'll just very briefly mention a few ways in which GANs can be used. So the one I'm going to talk about today is in accelerating simulations. So we have a simulator, which is very powerful, but very slow. And the idea is um, we can use um, GANs as a surrogate model to very, do very fast um, generation. But they may also be able to serve other purposes. For instance, uh, if you have a library of synthetic data that are very um, big in disk space, you might be able to replace them with an on-the-fly generator that could be a GAN. Um, and then GANs are also very good for high-dimensional interpolation. Um, you saw earlier today, I think, in terms of faces. Um, but here, uh, we're thinking about scientific data and interpolating in high-dimensional spaces um, between um, synthetic or uh, data examples. Um, but today, I'm going to tell you about um, the first one. I'm going to spend all the time that I have telling you about how we can use GANs as surrogate models to accelerate um, physics-based simulations. OK, so here's a schematic picture of a collision with the Large Hadron Collider in all of its glory. And it's definitely not to scale, because this picture is supposed to scan, uh, span uh, over 20 orders of magnitude in distances. So the, the smallest distance scales, where the, the constituents of protons collide is at 10 to the minus 20 meters. And then they fly out and um, span uh, many orders of magnitude as they um, hit our detectors, um, which are macroscopic sized objects in a room that are you know, meters um, uh, and smaller. And this whole procedure can be very slow. So it can take minutes to simulate one event. And this is a challenge if you want to um, uh, simulate um, billions or trillions of events, because we need to have at least as much synthetic data as we do real data. Um, and so that poses a significant challenge. Uh, OK, so uh, it turns out that most of the simulation time is in one piece of software. So there are actually many um, simulations that are stacked together to span all those orders of magnitude. But the one that takes the most time is when you have particles that are produced and they hit the detector material. And then you have to transport the particles through the material um, all the way down from their high energy down to ionization energy um, where they don't move anymore. 
and this is done with a, um, a computing, uh, some, some software called JNOT4, uh, which can generally take um, particles and uh, propagate them through matter. And this takes something like order one fraction of all um, high energy physics computing resources. So if we can speed it up, that would make a big impact on, on the whole field. Um, so our goal is to replace, or at least augment, um, simulation steps with a, a faster, powerful generator based on state-of-the-art machine learning, for instance, again. Um, and we're going to attack the slowest part. So of our whole detector, the slowest part of the simulation is in a part called the calorimeter. Um, so there are generically two kinds of detectors. You can either um, bend particles magnetic field and measure the trajectory, or you can try to stop them and measure how much heat you get by stopping them. And stopping a particle is very slow, very um, simulation intensive because you have to propagate the energy of the particle all the way from the high energy down to the ionization. And so we're going to try to attack um, that part of the simulation. Um, okay, so uh, now a, a, a collision event at the Large Hadron Collider might produce a thousand particles, but um, we don't want to do a full end-to-end -end simulator because that would be really um, very difficult. Um, so instead, we're more modest, and the idea is um, what we want to do instead is, is generate um, uh, the interaction from a single particle. So one particle hits our detector, and we want to um, simulate its interaction with our detector. And the nice feature that we're able to exploit here is a factorization property, um, which is that the energy from all the particles um, that's deposited is the sum of the sum of the energy. So in a given cell, the energy of the sum is the sum of the energies, basically. Um, so if we can simulate one uh, um, uh, interaction with the detector, we can simulate all of them. Um, and this is not true uh, in general, so not all parts of the simulation factorize, but the energy deposition part does. And so we can very efficiently take advantage of combinatorics. So if I have a, a library, for instance, that can generate some showers, I can mix and match them to generate an enormous um, set of synthetic data that can be used for um, inference. Uh, okay, so now uh, that's the physics background. Let me tell you about um, the machine learning. So uh, I think you've heard a bit earlier about what a generator is, but in this context, I like to think of generators as a function that maps noise to structure. Um, so this is, for instance, um, some random noise, and I want to have a, a model that learns that to generate that into structure. And our structure here is going to be calorimeter images. So we're going to think of our calorimeter as an image, and then we're going to use a generative model, in this case again, to generate those images. Uh, okay, so this is what a calorimeter, calorimeter image might look like. So I have uh, some chunk of material that's segmented, so it's like a pixelated um, object and say we shoot some particles at it, and those particles leave energy as they go through the segmented um, object. And I can then think of this as a grayscale, a single one-dimensional grayscale image, where uh, the pixel intensity that you see here corresponds to the energy deposited in that part of the detector. So this is great. I now have an image, um, grayscale image, which I can use for generation. Now, in practice, it's actually much more complicated than this, because we don't just have single images like this. Um, actually, it turns out that our detector uh, has multiple layers. That's already a complication. Um, but more importantly, the segmentation on each layer is not the same. So imagine you have an RGB image where the red, green, and blue channels all have different pixel sizes. So that's a significant challenge that we also would like to overcome uh, with, with these approaches. Now, just to give you uh, a sense, um, these images are roughly something like 30 by 30, so like a thousand dimensional. So the size of the problem, if you're thinking of it as like a probability distribution, is something like a thousand dimensional um, probability distribution. Um, and we'd like to generate um, uh, three images in this particular example that have different granularities and have a causal structure. So clearly the image for the third layer depends on the image for the second layer. Okay, um, and so our uh, strategy to attack this problem is with GANs. So you heard a lot about GANs earlier, um, and so I don't want to spend too much time uh, introducing them, but just as a reminder, um, the GAN, a GAN has two components, a generator network and a discriminator network. So the generator network learns to map noise to structure, that's the, this one, it takes noise, maps it into images. Um, and then we have another one, the discriminator network, that tells, tries to distinguish between um, generated uh, images and real images. And in this, case, in this case, our real images are actually still synthetic because the idea is trying to learn a simulator and make it faster. So we have um, images from a physics-based simulator that's very slow. And then we, have, uh, we learn a generative model to reproduce the simulator. And the discriminator is just supposed to distinguish between the two um, and decide if it um, looks realistic um, within the um, uh, structure of the physics-based simulator or not. Great, so the noise is a choice, it's a hyperparameter. In this case, we, we can pick a multidimensional Gaussian to start with, and this generator depends on what noise you pick. So you start with some noise structure, and the generator will learn to map into the, into the structured images and 
if I use a different noise, it'll learn a different generator. And they're obviously related up to a Jacobian. Okay. Okay, so now the model. Uh, and I'm gonna spend, there's a lot of information on this slide, so um, don't worry, I'm gonna spend a few minutes on it. Um, so this is the Calogan. So it's a GAN for doing telomere simulation. It's very fashionable to pen the word something in front of, of GAN. And so this is our um, Calogan. Uh, and so basically it has a structure where it takes as input a few things. So first it's a latent space. So this is the noise. So you have a thousand dimensional latent space, but you can think of it as just a, a very high dimensional multidimensional Gaussian. In this case, it's a 1024 dimensional. And then this whole structure here is that function that maps this noise into three images. So the output of one run of the um, generator is three images um, that correspond to each of the layers. Uh, now what we also have uh, is we want this um, uh, neural network to be able to be conditioned on various features. So in particular, um, we wanna be able to say, what, is the, um, what do the images look like depending on the energy of the incoming particle? So we feed, in addition to the latent space, um, the energy uh, of the incoming particle. And uh, then we have basically three uh, repeated units. And these three repeated units are gonna generate images for uh, each of the layers. And all the other structure here basically is to build in the causality between the layers. So the first thing we do is we generate an image uh, for the first layer. And I'm gonna tell you what this um, LAGAN means in, in just a second. But for now, it's a black box that, that generates an image of some size. Um, and then what we wanna do is we take that image and we resize it to be the same granularity as the second layer. And then we combine it with a totally independent random, random image for the second layer um, using uh, this structure here. And that gives us um, a new image which has some input from uh, totally random uh, input, this is independent, and a contribution from the first layer so that it can know about the causal structure between the first layer and the second layer. We then take the output of this combination and resize it once again to make it the same granularity as the last layer. And then this is combined with another independent random image from the, that represents the third layer. And these two are once again combined um, to get uh, an, an image which knows about um, the image from the previous layer. And so in this way, we have three images, all um, with some randomness, but also knowing um, something about the causality of the structure. Oh, it definitely matters because the, uh, I think about the picture, so we're shooting particles from one direction. Um, so they definitely come from this side and go to that side. Yeah. Um, and the granularities are also not the same, which makes it more complicated. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so um, there are a few other um, bits that I wanna tell you about. So first of all, um, like I said, we condition on energy, but we also wanna, for instance, condition on particle type. Uh, and particle type is a discrete, uh, is, is discrete, so whether it's like an electron or a proton. And we found it was actually better to make different networks than to um, share um, and have the same network, but this I think is another hyperparameter that one could, could optimize. Um, and our images are also very sparse. So unlike images of celebrities, um, where most of the pixels are activated, our images are, are very sparse. And in fact, many of the pixels are just totally zero. There's no energy deposited. Um, and so for this reason, it's, it's useful um, to have activation functions like the ReLU, which um, help encourage sparseness. Okay, so this is the generator side. Of, oh yeah, go ahead. Right. Right, right, so here it's a thousand dimensional, yeah, it's exactly, it's, a, it's the same thousand dimensional latent space. There's also a choice on um, how, it, how it's divided up. Um, that's a great question. So there are many properties of this network which can be optimized, and in particular, the size of the latent space, the size and structure of the latent space. So we did not optimize at all the size or structure. Uh, we basically picked a thousand. That's a big number and roughly the size of the dimensionality of the problem. Like I said, it's like roughly a thousand dimensional problem. So we expect that something roughly a thousand should be good. Um, but this is definitely an area where we're willing to optimize for. Okay, so in addition to the generator, we have to have a discriminator. So this is the, um, the adversary to the generator network, and it looks um, very similar, but basically it's, it's set up to run in the opposite direction. So this one takes as input three images, and it produces a uh, classification. So whether it's um, real or fake. And so um, as before, there are three, three images, one from each layer. Um, they get fed into this block, once again, this black box block box, which black box block, which I will describe in just a second. <laughs> yeah, that was difficult. Um, and so basically there, there are a couple of important features here. So one um, is that if we take a particle that say has some amount of energy and we shoot it at a calorimeter and it's totally absorbed in the calorimeter, we wanna make sure that the energy deposited on all the layers is equal to the energy of the initial particle so that there's some kind of conservation of energy. And then in the, in the generator structure, you see there's nothing that enforces that. It could in principle generate 
um, uh, uh, energies for the three layers that are not conserving, that don't, that don't um, sum to the initial energy. So what we want to do is we first um, build in some features so that we estimate the energy from each layer, and then we're going to feed the energy, the total energy, reconstructed energy, as a feature into this classifier um, to sort of enforce this energy conservation property so that it, it, it knows that it should be looking for um, Kellerman images that preserve that conserve energy. Um, the other um, uh, piece that we have is called mini-batch discrimination. And the idea here is that uh, if you look at single images, it's very hard to tell if it's real or fake. Um, but if you look at a, a small ensemble of images, um, it can be easier to tell because you can start estimating some statistical properties of your generated images. Um, and so a mini-batch discrimination set takes a, a mini-batch, so a small set, and from that computes um, features, which can then be fed into um, a fully connected network down the line. Um, to compute the, the full um, classifier that does the real versus fake. And so this um, neural network, which is the discriminator part, is combined with the generator part, and they uh, fight it out until they, um, uh, the discriminator is totally confused, um, and, it, and that's how it proceeds. So now, before I, I tell you how the results look like, I have to tell you what this, this black box is. So, um, it, so it's called LA. So the LA stands for um, locally aware. And in particular, this piece um, is composed of locally connected layers. And so I have to tell you what that means. So you've probably heard about convolutional neural networks and convolutional layers. Uh, so imagine you have an image. The, the de facto um, uh, approach for image data is to use a convolutional neural network where you have some kind of filter. Uh, and the filter is flipped across the image. And this um, gives us the output for a given filter. And you have many filters. Um, and this is how um, we can. Uh, take advantage of images that are tra translational invariants um, because this, um, this convolutional procedure here doesn't depend on where features are inside the image. Um, now the challenge with our, our images is that we've already pre-processed them because we know where the direction of the particle was and we know that should be the center of the image. And so as a result, our images are not translationally invariant. And so one can still use convolutional neural networks, but there's no translational invariance to take advantage of. Um, and so as a result, um, we want to do something a bit different. Um, now, convolutional neural networks are still very powerful because, um, of, because of the weight sharing, they have far fewer parameters than a fully connected network. So in, these, in this case, for instance, the number of parameters of a CNN scales with the filter size and not with the image size. If you have a fully connected network, the number of parameters scales um, combinatorically with the, with the size of the image, the number of pixels, whereas here it's basically fixed. You can have a much bigger image and have a, a fixed filter size that the number of parameters doesn't change. So we try to have a compromise between a fully connected network and a convolutional neural network, and the, and the um, compromise is called a locally connected network. And the idea is you take an image, you divide it into patches, and then in each patch, you have a convolutional neural network, basically. Um, so you have filters which are shared across different bits of the image. This is the, still has some weight sharing, but it's not global weight sharing. So imagine I have my patches, and then uh, these, I have a, a set of filters for each patch. And then those, um, so in, the, in these patches, basically the size of the filter sets the number of parameters. So this is nice because it takes advantage of the parameter reduction that we get from convolutional neural networks, um, but it has more local structure, can learn more easily local features that are not translationally invariant um, uh, than a convolutional network can, can learn. Okay, so uh, let's see how it works in practice. Um, so here are some images, the average images over many, many examples for the, the physics-based simulator. That's what we're trying to learn for the three different layers. And this is for the GAN. And you can see by the eye, it seems to do pretty, pretty well. So the, the, the z-axis here is um, logarithmically, is uh, exponentially spaced. You can see that over many orders of magnitude, it's really getting the bulk structure correct. Um, this is a pretty weak test of the GAN because these are just a few two-dimensional images um, that are averaged. But we'd like to know how well it's able to reproduce this multi-thousand dimensional um, distribution. Uh, okay, so one thing we can do is we can take um, some features of the thousand dimensional distribution and look at their um, histogram of those features. So for instance, I can ask, what is the distribution of the energy, total energy in the first layer? So this is just like a sum over all the cells in, in the first layer and what's in the distribution of the energy. And so the, the filled in histograms here are the physics-based simulator and the other ones are the GAN. And so you see qualitatively over many orders of magnitude, it does seem to reproduce some of the right features for different particles. So these three lines are different particles. There's electrons, photons, and then pion, which is like a, a lighter version of the proton. Um, but, you, but there are some, 
some qualitative differences in a few places, so clearly there's room for improvement. And we can repeat the same procedure for this, the second middle layer uh, and the third layer. Um, now, uh, as I know down here, at the moment, these features are not included in the training. But if there's any particular feature that you wanted to use, you could, of course, build it into the training. Remember, in the discriminator network, we built in some energy conservation requirements, so we could always put in these, these um, distributions as well. But we want to have at least some holdout in order to validate the procedure. Now, this brings me to one of the um, key challenges of GAN training, which is that um, it's hard to validate um, a thousand-dimensional distribution. There's basically no good way at the moment for doing that quantitatively. Um, so you could take some other, some any one-dimensional distribution you like. In this case, it's the depth-weighted total energy. So you take the total energy and weight it by how far it is, which, which layer it's on. And you can look at this distribution, just like the ones from the last distribution, and you see qualitatively it looks okay. But how do I know it's doing well in the full thousand-dimensional distribution with all the subtle correlations? Now, in, the, in industry, uh, usually you qualitatively look at images and you say, does this look like Angelina Jolie? And does this look like, this look like Brad Pitt? And usually that's sufficient. But in this case, for scientific quality uh, inference on you know, the theory of everything, that's, that's an usually insufficient. And so this is, I would say, a big uh, open research question. Um, and, and I think that science applications have, have a, a lot to say about how we can quantify uh, how well, quant quantitatively, how well um, a GAN is performing um, for these tasks. OK. Um, related is you might want to ask questions about overtraining. So uh, it's even more complicated because while we still can't visualize the thousand dimensional space, we, we, can, we can still ask some questions. So you might ask the question, uh, is the neural network memorizing? So the, the, con the, the analog of overtraining for a generator is it just literally repeating to you the things you gave it during training. That would be like memorizing. Um, and you might also be worried about another um, thing called mode collapse, which I know was discussed earlier, which is if your generator is only generating a small subset of the full range of possibilities, and they're very realistic, but they don't cover the full range of possibilities. Um, so that's called mode collapse. And one way you can sort of probe that is to look at the distance, in some sense, between your generated images and the real images, um, and then between uh, generated images and themselves. So for instance, in this case, these, um, these plots show a histogram of the distance in Euclidean space, if I think of my thousand dimensional image as just a vector in Euclidean space, the, the distance between uh, a generated, images, generated image and the nearest physics image. Um, this is um, take, a, take, a generated, fi or take a generated, find the nearest physics. This is physics, find the nearest generated. And basically, if these were delta functions at zero, you would know it's memorizing. So they're not delta functions at zero. That's good. So it doesn't look like it's obviously memorizing the input. And for the most part, GANs are really bad at memorizing, so this was not a surprise. Um, but uh, GANs do have a problem with mode collapse. And another way to, one way to probe mode collapse is to ask, take an image um, and ask, what, what is the distribution of the distance with, with its nearest image? So this is um, the GAN and all the nearest GAN neighbors. And this is the generator, the physics one, and all the nearest physics neighbors. So you'd, have, you'd imagine if there was some region of the uh, uh, full um, set of possibilities that's being oversampled, you would see a spike at zero. Basically, that would say that there's some region that's being oversampled. So there's some um, images which are very close to other images in the sample. And if you compare all four of these images, there's no obvious spike at zero. Um, and they look qualitatively the same as well. So the GAN images are basically just as far apart from the nearest GAN image as they are from a physics image. So it seems like it's interpreting pretty well. Although if you stare very quantitatively at these images, you see that, for instance, there are these spikes up here that are not down here. So this is an indication that there's no mode collapse and overtraining, but, but clearly this is only a, a one-dimensional projection of this really high-dimensional space. OK, um, and uh, the last thing I think I want to mention about um, the result uh, is about extrapolating. So GANs are, are really good at interpolating. So if you can go from Angelina Jolie to Brad Pitt, um, but they're not so good at then um, extrapolating to someone else. Um, but in our context, we can ask the question, what if I query the GAN to give me a particle whose energy it's never seen before? Um, and as long as there's no physical effects that happen um, for that energy, between the energy you trained and the new energy, in principle, it should give something sensible. So here you can see we queried um, uh, for a particle whose energy was uh, 150 in some units, which, and the, the training stopped at 100. Um, and actually, the uh, reconstructed energy is close to 150, so that's good. We queried, 100, we, we queried 150, and it basically still, the energy conservation that was built into the network um, survived until 150. Now, there's a, it's clearly not, not, not centered at 150, so these images will look a bit different, but still, uh, it seems like um, they're, they're, they're able to learn something a little bit outside of the domain that they were trained on. Okay, uh, 
So, so far, I've um, basically been talking about uh, images where we have uh, a fixed uh, energy and um, sampling the input latent space. But you could imagine doing the opposite. You could imagine uh, fixing uh, the energy and burying uh, the latent space to see how the neural network has learned the dependence on the latent space and if they have any physical meaning. So um, in particular, uh, what we can do is uh, we can condition, condition um, on the latent variables and see how the shower changes. So one thing we can do is we can say, uh, this is, a, a, this is a, for a fixed um, particle, we uh, don't change the latent space, we fix the noise, and we just vary the energy. And you can ask, how do the images look like if we vary the energy but fix the noise? And basically, um, uh, as you increase the energy, the particles are becoming deeper inside the calorimeter, which makes sense. So it's, it's a little bit hard to see that, but basically, um, this is the energy in the zeroth layer, the first layer, and the second layer, and uh, the amount of energy in each layer is increasing, which is good because there's more energy overall. Uh, and especially the last layer has quite a significant amount more energy because the particles are making it deeper into this, into this calorimeter. Uh, and we can also do things like move the position of the particle. Um, and so here you can see the particle moves as we, uh, the, the image moves as we change the input position. Um, and so this allows us to uh, sort of probe that the neural network is doing the right thing and also um, is a sort of a nice feature that we have built into the, the structure of the GAN. Okay, um, and then the whole point of this, of this process, as I told you, is to speed up the physics-based simulator. So here are just some timing results. Um, we have our slow physics-based simulator. It takes a long time to generate an, Im an image. Um, and for the single particle images, you know, in this benchmark computer, it took something like 1,000 milliseconds. And if you, do, if you use batching on GPU with the, with the GAN, it's, it's much, much faster. It can be like um, five orders of magnitude faster, which is not so surprising because it's not doing all the, physic the, the deep physics that the physics-based simulator is doing. And so uh, this uh, is one of the, the promising aspects of this approach. And uh, the very last thing I want to say before I finish um, is that everything I've shown you so far is sort of in the context of a, a small study using um, uh, standalone synthetic data. Um, but of course, ultimately, we would like to integrate this workflow into one of the big um, Large Hadron Collider collaborations. And this is uh, a challenge in and of itself. Um, because we have uh, many thousands of collaborators, a very uh, large, extensive, and old um, software code base, uh, but so far we're managing. And here is a, a plot which I think is really, really nice. Um, it's basically a random plot, but it shows um, that there's a GAN. So what I like about this plot is two things. There's the word GAN and the word Atlas. Um, basically it shows that uh, in a big LHC collaboration, we've managed to integrate uh, a GAN and, and actually also a variational autoencoder into the um, software stack to do some, some deep comparison. And the actual distributions here are not quite so relevant because it's still early days. Okay, so that brings me um, to the end of my presentation. So neural network generation, I think, is a, a systematically improvable path forward to increase the fidelity and hopefully the speed of surrogate models. Um, implementing these tools is really a challenge, and I think there's a lot of interesting technical as well as um, machine learning and scientific challenges ahead of us. And in particular, the key challenge, which is trying to identify when a GAN is a good GAN, um, and uh, then identifying when we do um, uh, neural network training, um, when, we, when we can stop and then compare to um, the state of the art. Uh, so I'd like to thank my, my collaborators on the various projects and uh, the, sli the slides I think should be online and you're, and you're welcome to, to look at all the references, um, including uh, a code and, and synthetic data. And that brings me to the end.